Thanks. What a fantastic course. You sent me the, uh, the syllabus. As you know, I was a philosophy major as an undergrad, and I found it really kind of boring. Um, and um, I moved over to psychology because I thought that's where really all, it just felt a lot juicier, a lot of uh, uh, topics that uh, really interested me and that you could actually study. And then along comes Steve in the 90s, and he starts saying, why does philosophy have to be boring and divorced from psychology, which it used to be merged with? Uh, and so this class I, uh, is the result, and really philosophy has been changed. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be uh, talking to you. I've already had such a warm, enthusiastic reception from many of you. Thank you. Uh, so today, our, as you know, our time is limited. I will be sure to stop talking by 20 after so that we have 15 minutes for, for your questions and, and uh, discussion. Um, I thought what I would do is just briefly go through what I'm calling the rationalist uh, delusion. I mentioned it in chapter four. Briefly, let me tell you a little bit more about it. Here's a way, here's a way that I think about it. So the word delusion uh, is defined in the dictionary as a false conception and persistent belief, unconquerable by reason, in something that has no existence in fact. And Richard Dawkins gives us an example of how to uh, work with delusions, study them, and talk about them. He is admirably clear in describing the God delusion as a belief in a superhuman, supernatural intelligence who deliberately designed and created the universe and everything in it. So if you believe that, Dawkins says, you are deluded. And he writes a whole book on your delusion. Um, the hallmark of a delusion is, again, not just that it is a false belief, but that even when you're faced with reasons and evidence, you don't change your mind. Um, and of course, it has to be a belief in something that doesn't exist. So I think that um, by Dawkins' definition, uh, rationalism, or at least there is a, a kind of faith in rationalism that is very much like the faith in God that uh, Dawkins described. And as you'll see at the end of the talk, I will hoist Dawkins on his own petard. At least that's my hope. Uh, so the rationalist delusion I'm defining as a belief in a reliable faculty of reasoning. So if you believe that there exists a reliable faculty of reasoning, and this faculty is capable of operating effectively and impartially, even when self-interest, reputational concerns, and intergroup conflict pull toward a particular conclusion. If you believe that, and you have been exposed to the relevant research on reasoning, which is all pretty dismal, and you still persist in believing that such a faculty exists, then I posit uh, that you suffer from the rationalist delusion. Now, none of you in this room would suffer from it, but many philosophers, many psychologists even, some, not that many, but in moral development, uh, many of them still do, I believe. Um, in the 60s and 70s, sort of the high point of, of uh, uh, analytic philosophy and its influence on psychology mm -hmm. as information processing and all of that, during that time, E.O. Wilson, in 1975, in his famous book, Sociobiology, made this prophecy that the time has come for ethics to be removed temporarily from the hands of the philosophers and biologicized, made part of the new synthesis. And he tells us what that means. He, said he wants to put ethics on a new footing, take it out of the hands of analytic style philosophers and rationalists. Um, uh, he says that those folks, they, what they're really doing is they're simply intuiting the canons of morality, the, the principles, by consulting their emotive centers. Only by interpreting the activity of the emotive centers as a biological adaptation can the meaning of those ethical canons be deciphered. So of course that's what uh, my book is about is basically a giant vindication of Wilson's uh, prophecy, I think. I think events have conspired, not well, events have come together very much as he said. Uh, this is the hardcover, uh, this is the UK edition, which I'm very fond of, but boy am I glad it's not here in the US. It would have precluded me from talking to many, many audiences. Uh, and this is the paperback, which some of you have. So as you know, uh, the book is structured around three principles. You've already read, uh, I guess you were assigned to finish the book for today, so I won't go into details. I'll just show you some illustrations that I think will um, make it more fun, will fit with what you've been reading. Uh, so if we think about these three models of the relation between reason and, uh, we can call it emotion, is what it used to be, what it used to focus on. Um, and one of the oldest ideas in intellectual history is the idea that the mind is divided into parts that sometimes conflict. And wherever you look east or west, there's sort of an idea that there's some sort of higher, more reasoning area, and then some sort of lower, more animal-like uh, 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 faculty. Uh, Plato gives us many metaphors uh, in the um, Timaeus. He uh, says that the gods created 
mankind. They put reason in those orbs, and the orbs had a role on the ground, so we had, they had to create the bodies. Uh, so that's one metaphor. The other is the Phaedrus. Reason is the charioteer, and the passions, the noble passions, the base passions, are the horses. And if, if a man studies philosophy and learns to control those passions, then he can escape the bondage of reincarnation um, uh, and uh, return to the gods. Now, I think this view, the idea that reason, of course, Plato didn't say that reason is the master in most people, but he said it can be. It is in philosophers, and everyone should strive for it. So he believed it was possible. I think this view of reason has taken quite a beating since the 1990s, certainly from the neuroscientists. Uh, who found that when you lose your emotionaries, you don't get hyper-rational. In fact, uh, you either become unable to really think, because reasoning actually depends critically on emotion and intuition, uh, or if you're still able to think at all, you become more, more like a psychopath who simply doesn't have any emotions informing his reasoning. So I think the reason as master view has taken quite a beating, and I'll give it more of a beating. Uh, model two, the idea that reason is a servant. Uh, this is, as you know, the model that, that I endorse uh, that reason is a great helper, but it simply is not qualified to lead. Uh, but rather than speaking of reason as a, a slave, which is, is Hume's word, or a servant, um, I think if we think about it as a really intelligent servant, really more like a press secretary. This is Robert Gibbs, Obama's first press secretary. Uh, and he's a um, very, very smart guy. They're partners. They work together. Uh, but you will never change Obama's mind by convincing his press secretary that something is wrong. That's just not the way the system's designed. So it just structurally can't happen that way. Uh, now, Hume said that the passions uh, were the master. Jesse Prince embraces emotion straight out. He says we can do all this work with emotion. I used to think that in the 90s. I don't think that anymore. I think we really need to talk about intuition more broadly. Uh, a lot of the things I've studied have been moral emotions. But as you'll see, there are many cases of just gut feelings that aren't exactly emotions. Now, you might say, well, OK, maybe reason is not the master, but it could certainly be an equal partner. And this is the view that Josh Green has and that Darsha Narvaez has. Green gives us the idea of Kant and Mill fighting it out in the brain. Um, Darsha Narvaez uh, uses the metaphor of dancing. Now, it seems to me that if you have dancing, you have one person leading, the other following. But uh, she says, well, it's a different kind of dancing where they take turns. OK. Um, but even if you downgrade it from master, to equal partner. Is the evidence that we have on reasoning, is that consistent with reason even playing an equal partner role? Is reasoning good enough, independent enough, uh, to play the role of equal partner? Um, I don't think so. Uh, so as you know, uh, I began my research studying these various emotions, uh, doing this research on harmless taboo violations. Um, I'll just show you. Uh, and uh, what I found was that while I could get Penn students, I could get highly educated uh, college students to say, well, that's disgusting, but that doesn't make it wrong. Um, if you push them hard enough, you can still get them to go with their gut feelings. And outside of college, the great majority of people go with their gut feelings. Um, so I'll just show you here. Actually, here. Um, this is a different one than, uh, actually, I'm sorry, it's the same story as is covered in the book. It's the incest story. And uh, you'll so you know the story, Julian Marker, sister and brother. This is hidden camera, hidden microphone. Uh, it picked up some sort of transmissions in some Croatian language or something through the ceiling. But anyway, you'll hear, you'll see this guy responding to the story, and you'll see the exact moment when he gets dumbfounded. Julie and Mark, who are brother and sister, are traveling together in France. They, they are both on summer vacation from college. One night they are staying alone in a cabin near the beach. They decide that it would be interesting and fun if they tried making love. At the very least, it would be a new experience for each of them. Julie was already taking birth control pills, but Mark uses a condom too, just to be safe. They both enjoy it, but they decide not to do it again. They keep that name as a special secret between them, which makes them feel even closer to each other. So what do you think about this? Was it wrong for them to have sex? Yeah, I do believe it was wrong for them to have sex. Why is that? Um, first, it's forbidden in the Bible. It's uh, socially unacceptable. Personally, I find it just disgusting, impulsive. You know, I have a little sister of my own, and just the whole concept makes me nauseous. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's those three right reasons right there. Mm -hmm. uh, let's look um, one at a time. If um, just because something is repulsive to you, you want to say that always makes it wrong, would you? No, no, I, I wouldn't. But um, in this situation, though, I just. I think for the most part, most people would find it repulsive. Mm -hmm. So 
that's I just really in this case too I just wouldn't want somebody else to do it feel so strongly about it mm -hmm. um let me see what else you're saying the, that the the Bible says it's wrong I'm not too up on it so I'm not I can't say argue what the Bible says exactly or not well I'm, I'm not a very devout Christian but in this case I I can see I'm just it, it makes logical sense so the consequences of incest I've just been known for thousands of years birth effects you know of that nature and yeah I, I believe it is wrong and it was forbidden um, but aren't there uh, like all sorts of things the Bible forbids that we don't think is wrong even if you're a devout Christian perhaps well that's true but in this case too I, I there's enough scientific evidence that shows you know that there is other consequences to it mm -hmm. that I believe that there are some you know I, I'm going with the Bible in this case because mm -hmm. modern science also proves that it's just a bad move well oh, sure yeah if they're going to have kids that would be you know, clearly wrong but I mean um, she's on birth control and uses a condom so there's no way that there's going to be a kid to come with this so that, that wouldn't be a problem I <laughs> um here's where he gets dumbfounded I still don't advocate it in the slightest I think it's just mostly because I, I just think it's repulsive I mean um, yeah, I don't know what your, your feelings are on this but if uh, I mean personally I would find um, I don't know what I'm saying here I, I would find homosexual sex repulsive it's nothing that I would want to witness but I don't say it's wrong because you know if people are inclined to that and they're it's looking more and more like it's, you know, genetic sort of thing. I can't say there's anything wrong with it, even though I would find it personally repulsive to watch or something like that, you know? Um, so, I, again, I don't, I don't think just because a person finds something repulsive, you can say it's wrong. You can say, I don't want to see it, I don't like it, but you can't say it's wrong just because you find it repulsive. I, I, I agree and I, I respect that opinion, but <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid I'm, I'm not swearing on this topic. <laughs> I just I just feel too strongly against it. Yeah. Okay, uh, I respect that opinion, but I'm not swaying on the topic. I just feel too strongly against it. Here's another woman who says, I don't have like a point that says, okay, that's why it's wrong, but it's like a gut thing where I think it's wrong. I mean, you could try to possibly change my mind, but I probably wouldn't. So these sorts of experiences, seeing this over and over again, uh, that it was just very hard to argue people out of their moral convictions, even uh, when the premises that they gave could be completely refuted, even to their satisfaction. So this led me to uh, upgrade or update Hume's model into what I call the social intuitionist models. This is the basic Humean process right there. But I made it more social by adding in the other person. Moral judgment doesn't just happen in your head like color perception. It's, it's a social thing. We gossip, we argue, we prepare for arguing. Um, and because um, we are at least capable of uh, changing our minds. It, it, lots of people would insist to me that they'd done it before. Uh, and so I put it in as at least a dashed line. We all have the perception that we've done. I don't doubt that we sometimes do. Uh, and some people do it more than others. Some people actually do have weaker emotions and stronger reasoning, uh, philosophers, for example. So sometimes it can happen that you simply reason your way to a conclusion just because of the evidence. But I, if you think about the number of times you make a snap judgment uh, as you're walking on campus, as you're driving your car, I mean, it's dozens or hundreds of times a day. How many of you can think of a time in the last week when you changed your mind on a moral issue by just or judgment of someone just by thinking through the evidence raise your hand okay a few of you can think of a time in the last week how many of you can think of a time when you judge someone in the last uh, in the last day for any reason whatsoever okay so we make lots and lots of judgments and they're almost all snap rapid uh, judgments that don't involve a lot of reflection i just want to point out that four of the six links in the model are actually kinds of reasoning uh, people often set things up um, Everyone likes a nice dichotomy, and so uh, you know they say, "Well, height says that it's all emotion, not cognition." Um, and my response is, "No, it's all cognition. It's just that there are different kinds of cognitions. There's reasoning cognition, there's intuitive cognition." Um, in terms of more direct experimental evidence, I won't go into the hypnosis study. You read about that in the book. Uh, I'll just show you the data. You know, the, we hypnotize people to feel a flash of disgust at uh, the words "take" versus "often," just two arbitrary words. Here's the data. Um, the, as a manipulation check, when people were asked to judge how disgusting a story was, 
uh, they, the red is, is the average rating on stories with hypnotic disgust. So much more disgusting on a scale of 0 to 100 um, if there was disgust. They discounted that somewhat. So when they made moral judgments, it wasn't as big as their disgust difference. But they still said that things were more wrong if they felt a little flash of something in, uh, while they were judging. Um, and then the most fun thing, this the thing we tacked, uh, tagged on at the end, tacked on at the end uh, about a Dan who tries to take topics that were appealed to professors and students. Uh, when there's no disgust present, this is a frequency plot. When there's no disgust present, everybody aimed for the left edge of the paper. Nobody said it was wrong. Uh, but when there was hypnotic disgust present, a third of the people said this was wrong. Even this case, where nothing could possibly be wrong. Uh, but you send Robert Gibbs out to justify. You say, "Go, you know, go." I, I feel that this is wrong somehow. Press secretary, find me a justification for condemning Dan. And everybody sends out their press secretary. Most of them come back empty-handed. Boss, I can't do it. The guy's clean. I can't find anything on him. All right, we'll say zero. But a third of the time, he comes back and says, "You know, I think we can nail this guy on brown nosing." Yeah, that's it, brown nosing. OK, so um, we can say it's wrong, and then we can say he's just somehow he's sucking up to the professors. That's it. Right, so it's this terrible, terrible reasoning. Uh, but this is what we do. When we want to condemn someone, we look really, really hard for reasons. Um, I've used many means of augmenting disgust, fart spray, dirty desks, uh, videos, you know, the train spotting video about a dirty toilet. And in all of these cases, we find the same thing, flashes of disgust. Uh, will augment moral judgment. But you don't need emotion. Uh, Nick Epley and others have done great work. Uh, you know, If you have people nodding their head or shaking their head, they're more likely to think that something is right or wrong, depending on which way their head is moving. Um, David Pizarro, if you're standing near a hand sanitizer, it activates thoughts of purity. No emotion, just act concepts of purity. Uh, you become more critical, especially of sexual violations. Uh, and when we add that work to the mountain of research on motivated reasoning, confirmation bias, and the fact that nobody has been able to teach critical thinking, um, there's a little bit of progress. You know, if you take a statistics class, uh, you'll, you'll change your thinking a little bit. But if you try to train people to look for evidence on the other side, it can't be done. It, it shouldn't be hard, but nobody can do it. And they've been working on this for decades now. At a certain point, you have to just say, might you be searching for Atlantis, and Atlantis doesn't exist? Um, the, um, uh, the famous article, the, the Argumentative Theory of Reasoning, uh, Mercier and Sperber, they say that skilled arguers are not after the truth, but after arguments supporting their views. So if you put all that together, I, I, I think this principle is now pretty clear. It's not that we don't reason. It's that intuitions come first. And intuition then structures the space in which we do our reasoning. Um, if you think that people can, you can say, OK, now jury, please look on both sides equally, and then reach your verdict. We're not capable of doing that as individuals. On to the second point. There's more to morality than harm and fairness. Um, you know, when, so in the Middle Age, in the um, Enlightenment, as God was no longer available to philosophers, as the, to some philosophers, as the grounding for morality, and uh, philosophers had to find some other way to justify saying that something is wrong or, or imposing regulations on people. There are really only two anchors that they seem to find. Either you can ground things in harm and suffering. that It's wrong to hurt people. Um, and of course, Bentham uh, was the first to do this really systematically, and John Stuart Mill, and more recently, Peter Singer. So there's a, a, a monism. It's very, very popular in the academy. There's a, sort of the idea that if you can explain something complex with just one principle, you win a prize. I mean, that's, that's real progress. And of course, since Newton, that has been progress in the natural sciences. Um, the, other, the other possible candidate is fairness or justice. Uh, as Lawrence Kohlberg wrote, virtue is ultimately one, not many. And it's always the same ideal form, regardless of climate or culture. The name of this ideal form is justice. And this is so much of the history of moral philosophy. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, I'm a Kantian, I'm a, 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 a million, a, you know, utilitarian, deontologist. Uh, just goes back and forth and back and forth on whose monism is, is the proper one, whose one principle. Um, I, this, is gonna, this is sort of heretical to say in the sciences, but I, I'm opposed to the pursuit of parsimony. Um, I think it's not something that psychologists should be searching for. I take Occam very literally uh, that you should, um, that if two explanations are both equally good, well, sure, then go with the simpler. But in the history of my field, the history of psychology, 
to philosophy has been if you can possibly explain something with one principle, just do it, because that's better. Well, whoever designed human beings, namely evolution, but whoever designed human beings didn't give a damn about parsimony. We are not parsimonious creatures. And I think that these efforts to justify our, this incredibly complicated facility that we have to rest it all on a single foundation are just doomed to failure. Um, I really came to see this when I was working with Richard Schwader, the anthropologist at the University of Chicago. Um, and as you know, from trying to review, trying, trying to make sense of you know, cultural psychology is so clearly right and evolutionary psychology is so clearly right, um, came to believe that there are six best candidates for being the bridges between uh, these two fields, six uh, areas where you can really easily point to a clear evolutionary story that you didn't make up yourself. Um, so issues of care and harm, uh, fairness and cheating, um, uh, you know, Trivers, reciprocal altruism, all of that. Uh, liberty and oppression. Um, well, I'll skip that. Loyalty and betrayal. Uh, we're the only creatures that are able to form groups that are not based on kin uh, in order to compete with other groups. Uh, we love it so much that we invented fandom. Um, uh, authority and subversion. I mean, we, we show deference in some ethologically similar ways, behaviorally similar ways. It would be rather weird to say that some, somehow Authority was something that we just made up culturally. We, we were not designed to show it like the, all the other primates. Um, and finally, sanctity and degradation. Uh, of course, it's, it's clearest in religious contexts, but you find some sanctity thinking on the left as well. When you're talking about sexuality, uh, there's a big, big culture war. Um, uh, so of course, you find it in, in, in Islam, in, in uh, Judaism, the idea of, of somehow you need to prepare your body for contact with God. Uh, that we are animals, but we're also children of God, and you have to prepare your body uh, to um, to engage in these uh, in religious functions. Uh, so at yourmorals.org, there was a version of this graph uh, in the in the paper. It's a little different. The one I have in the book is a little different. Uh, but the ba basic finding, as you know, is that people on the left endorse only three of the six, and even there, they put care above all else. Um, and uh, people on the right endorse all six, really roughly equally. And they don't say, oh, well, our top priority is to, is to protect suffering. So you know, almost every cultural issue, I think, can, is illuminated by this simple graph. You know, gun control. I mean, people are getting killed. Children are getting killed. That's all you need to know. Um, we might, we've got to get rid of guns or limit them severely. Uh, but on the right, there are issues of, uh, of uh, liberty, um, uh, self-protection, proportionality, rights. Uh, so, on the left, if you, I, I, when I first got to New York two years ago, Occupy Wall Street was just starting up. And uh, there were so many signs about compassion, empathy. I just got this cartoon by email. Um, equality to a conservative versus equality. This, this is so revealing about the last election. So obviously, the cartoonist is, is politically liberal. And uh, he thinks that equality to conservative is fine. Let everybody, everybody has their box. This guy can see. This kid can't. Tough luck. They're all equal. Whereas to a liberal, liberal says, well, he doesn't need his box. So why don't we take it from him, give it to him, and now everyone's equal. And obviously that justifies very heavily redistributive, redistributive taxation. Rich people don't need all that money when there are hungry people around. So take it from the rich people, give it to the poor people. That would be, uh, that would be fair, according to people on the left. Um, but on the left, there is a rather, often a, a really visceral rejection of authority, loyalty, group loyalty, and sanctity. Um, this is about as sacrilegious as one can get in terms of the sort of the national religion of uh, the troops that are risking their lives for the country. Are um, it's a it's a quasi religious act. The services are a quasi religious branch of the government, and so to say, fuck the troops is uh, as sacrilegious as can be. Even if most people on the left don't think this, some do, and people on the right flat, uh, send these sorts of images all around to stoke outrage. Um, sanctity and purity concerns. Uh, this is a very different view of female chastity. This is Madonna from Madonna's book, Sex. Uh, and uh, this bumper sticker, I think this was in the book. Your body may be a temple, but mine's an amusement park. Uh, the subtext being, you stupid, prudish conservatives. I took this photo at Occupy Wall Street. I have no idea what it means. But you could never, ever see a sign that says nothing is sacred at a conservative function. It just couldn't happen. Um, uh, so I think this is why liberals are more enticed by, uh, by monism. Because if, you're, if you only have three ethics to begin with, and one of them is clearly preeminent, well, utilitarianism just jumps out at you. It's the obviously correct uh, moral theory. All right, that's all I'll say about principle number two. OK, we're doing fine on time. We'll have plenty of time for discussion. Uh, principle three, morality binds and blinds. 
Um, so, <clears throat> you know, people often ask me about, well, you know, the world's going to hell and, and there's all this war and corruption. And I, you know, I, I say, well, I, I actually have very low standards. Um, I, it's a, you know, you look out at the world and, and you think about evolution and, and it's, just, it's an absolute miracle that we cooperate at all. Um, I mean, there's almost no violence. Um, there, you know, I couldn't say that 20, 30 years ago when everybody knew someone had been mugged recently, but um, by, that was a temporary thing caused by leaded gas. Um, violence has been plummeting for millennia, as Steve Pinker has shown. There was a temporary surge. Do you know this? This is the, I mentioned in the book, it turns out there's a, uh, uh, there's a recent article in The Atlantic with more scholarship on this. Um, it was basically we, um, leaded gas was uh, so prevalent in the atmosphere. Uh, I just had lunch the other day with one of the lawyers for the EPA who got this through the ban and through in the 70s. Um, leaded gas, so we're pumping hundreds of millions of tons of lead up into the air. It's coming down all over the country. Um, kids in cities are getting a lot more of it. That's why crime rates shot up in cities, uh, much more so. Um, big cities used to have much higher crime rates than small cities. Uh, but once New York City took the lead out in late 70s, and then three years later, everyone else did nationally, crime rates plummeted, first in New York. And it, why did crime plummet in 1993? Oh, it must be Rudy Giuliani. And then three years later, everywhere else. So um, it turns out it was that. Anyway, so it's a little aside. I just love this. I, I'm, I live in New York now, and it's unbelievably safe. There are no cops, no crime, nothing. Everything's fine. And I grew up in New York, and it wasn't like that. So I'm sorry. I'm just still amazed at how our world has been transformed by taking lead out in the 70s. All right, back to our story. Um, uh, it's amazing that we can cooperate, and there's almost no violence. Um, the only other animals that can do that are the hymenoptera uh, ter and also termites, things like that. Um, and so to me, you know, the great miracle that I really tried to figure out in the last 10 or 15 years, I've really been focused on, is you know, how do we go from hunter-gatherers to this, to Babylon, in the space of just a few thousand years? I mean, it's unbelievable. It shouldn't happen. Um, there's no precedent for that on this planet. Well, there is precedent in the hymenoptera and other ultrasocial animals, but, but not for creatures that are not kin. Um, but, you know, bang, we get Babylon, we get Tenochtitlan. I mean, how did this happen? And I believe a big part of the story is our ability to make things sacred. Um, we, uh, if you, all around the world, people express their religious feelings in somewhat similar ways. They tend to circle around sacred objects, literally circle. Um, these are Muslims circling the Kaaba at Mecca. And when you circle, it's as though you pass a wire through a magnetic field and you generate electricity, you generate an electric charge. Durkheim used the metaphors of electricity, uh, collective effervescence when groups get together like this. Uh, it's not just religion. The flag is a quasi is a sacred symbol of the nation. It's the same psychology. Nationalism and religion involve much of the same psychology, um, and this allows these men to circle around it and bond together and trust each other. But when we circle around sacred objects uh, and we generate this electrical charge, this metaphorical electrical charge, it's as though it, it, it splits apart good and evil. We, we see the world in terms of good and evil, and we're good, they're evil. It's very difficult to get people to listen to reason when you have this sort of thing going on, which we all do. I just want to point out that once you take this perspective, that humans have this unique way of getting groups together, making them cohesive, and for what purpose? Why is it important to have a cohesive group? Right, to fight other groups, because our ancestors have been fighting each other and cooperating too. But we have this dynamic of intergroup competition uh, has been going on for uh, a couple hundred thousand years at least, and to, in some ways for millions of years. Um, so once you see human groups as competing, and, and competing in part on their ability to become cohesive and to form communities of trust, um, well, suddenly it's kind of obvious that we evolved by multi-level selection, including group selection. It's kind of obvious that the genes sitting inside you today were not selected just because your great-great-great-great-grandfather beat out the guy next to him. It's because your great, 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 et cetera, et cetera, you know, grandparents and their community survived the famine or survived the war when the group next to them didn't. That's why the genes we have in us are here, because of selection at multiple levels. And once you see it that way, then you actually, then you, it's easy to see how religion was an adaptation, which of course the new atheists are committed to doubting. They cannot grant that religion was an adaptation, because if it was an adaptation, then we can't just rip it out. If it's a virus, then obviously we have to rip it out. Now, I, I've had some dealings with the, the new atheists, um, and it's always been rather unpleasant. Uh, and what I've come to see is that they 
you know, they deny religion, but actually they, they show all the same um, psychology of religion that religious people do. Lots of people have pointed that out, but I want to specifically add that what they sacralize is reason. You know, if you sacralize Jesus Christ or you sacralize some ancestor, you know, that binds your group together. And you might say, well, other, other people are infidels. But that's not really so insulting. If you sacralize reason, then what are your enemies? They're irrational. They're stupid. Um, so this is the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science. We are liberated by calculation and reason to visit regions of possibility that had once seemed out of bounds or inhabited by dragons. This is the rationalist delusion. This is what Plato believed. Reason is our highest attribute. It works beautifully if we can just rip uh, religion out. And if we can just let ev teach everybody to reason, uh, then we'll be fine. Um, this is Sam Harris's Project Reason, Spreading Science and Secular Values. We're going to encourage critical thinking and erode the influence of dogmatism, superstition, and bigotry. Um, so it would be interesting to know whether they themselves have been successful in their critical thinking and whether they've eliminated dogmatism from their own thinking. That would be very interesting to know. Um, here's another one of these guys, uh, Massimo Piliucci, uh, at the, uh, the header of his blog. He, he says, um, uh, rationally, you know, rationally speaking, he calls the blog Rationally Speaking. Uh, he, he, worship, he thinks that it, we should all be uh, someone who devotes himself to the tracking down of prejudices. So that's great. I'm sure he's a great thinker. Well, um, I, I gave a talk on the absence of, con of conservatives in social psychology, and, and John Tierney wrote it up in the New York Times, and Massimo Piliucci um, uh, read the Times article and basically called me a liar, uh, said in his blog that um, this is a common thing you see. Say either he's stupid or he's lying. Well, I know he's not stupid, so he must be lying. Um, so he did, uh, now he didn't, uh, so Piliucci says all these bad things about me without actually watching the talk. The talk was available online. Tierney had a link to it. Um, Piliucci didn't watch the talk. And I challenged him on that. I said, well, did you watch the talk? And then he said, I have seen the talk. Now that was ambiguous. I, we, okay, you've seen it now in his next person. You've seen it now, but had you seen it when you read it? And he still wouldn't admit it. Basically, I caught him lying, trying to trick his readers to believe that he had, you know, Sleazy, well, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. I'm sorry. You see what happens? You get caught up in it emotionally. You start getting angry. Um, so uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a research psychologist. I don't get angry. I get even with data. So the, the similarity among all these guys, um, with the exception of Dan Din, Dan's a little bit different, but the similarity of most of them and their style was such that I thought, well, let me test this. Are they really more dogmatic than other scientists? So I, I took the full text of a bunch of books, and I ran it through the Luke program, Linguistic Inquiry Word Count. It counts up words and puts them in. Has, uh, uh, Jamie Pennebaker has validated with all kinds of different categories. And there were two categories that were a priori relevant. One was anger. How angry are they? The other was certainty. If you're, if you're fighting dogmatism, you should be open-minded, right? But if you're dogmatic, you're always saying, certainly it's the case. It's always the case. It's never the case. So for anger words, I took, so these are all the, um, this is the complete, this is the word count, the percentage of words in L, uh, Sober and Wilson's book, um, uh, Unto Others, uh, Dan Dennett's book, so Dan Dennett, so he's a new atheist, but he's not angry. Um, uh, this is my book, The uh, Happiness Hypothesis, and Scott, so books on religion, um, uh, the, the anger rate in those books is relatively low. Um, uh, but now here we have Harris and Dawkins, much higher and especially Harris. So that validates what we know. When you read it, that's what you hear. And just for fun, I thought, well, where would you put Glenn Beck and, and Ann Coulter um, and, and Michael Sam? And the answer is uh, that, the, that uh, Harris and Dawkins nestle right in among the right-wing uh, ideologues. So their claim to be so open-minded, non-dogmatic, is not doing so well. Let's look at the certainty category. Uh, and here, the effect is even starker. And here, actually, Dennett joins the new atheists, because he too uses these formulations. Certainly it is the case. It must be the case. It is always the case. That's not the way scientists talk. But that's the way ideologues talk. That's the way moralists talk. That's what our righteous minds do. So to conclude, morality, uh, oh, we've got plenty of time. Morality binds and blinds. Um, I hope I've convinced you that this idea that reason is our most noble attribute, that if we could just learn to do it right, we can then escape all these biases and corruption. I hope I've convinced you that this is a delusion. Uh, no matter how many courses you take on rational thinking and good thinking, um, well, it's possible that some individuals will make progress. But if you do it on a large scale, you, won't, you don't, just don't get any progress. Um, so I, it's a delusion. But I'm not just saying let's throw up our hands in the air and say, OK, we're irrational. So what? 
Um, there is an alternative, and it's intuitionism. Um, sometimes intuition on its own beats reasoning, even within a single individual. If you try and decide uh, which poster you like or, or a variety of, of, of consumer decisions, where when people are encouraged to think about it and list reasons, they're then less happy with their choice. So sometimes intuition is actually better. But for difficult things, for public policy uh, uh, things, it, it's not. It's definitely not. You, you don't want to just tell people, oh, scientists say that reason doesn't work. So go ahead, Congress. Just legislate like you feel. You know, that's, that's terrible. Um, I mean, it could even be worse than what they presently do. And that would be pretty bad. Um, my point is that each of us as individuals is limited like a neuron. Neurons are not very smart on their own. Uh, they do one thing and they do it well. Humans do one thing very, very well. We're really, really good at finding evidence um, to support what we want to believe, and, we're also, and related to that, at finding evidence to disconfirm what others want to believe. Um, so each of us is a neuron. Neurons are not that smart. Uh, but if you put us together in the right ways, then you get a brain. Brains are really, really smart. Um, and so we need each other to think. We need each other to challenge our reasoning. And this is one of the reasons why we need diversity. Uh, uh, particularly ideological diversity, intellectual diversity. Um, uh, we don't have that anymore. I'm just finishing a paper now showing that uh, in the 20th century, there was some ideological diversity in the academy. It was always dumb, predominantly liberal. Uh, but there were um, 10 20% were conservatives or Republicans until the 90s. And then it drops to about 10% overall. And in my field, it's only 5 or 6%. Um, of tenured faculty, it's probably much lower than that. Essentially, they're in the closet. Um, in fact. I mean, I'll just, I'm curious. I'd like to know what the composition is here. Uh, please raise your hand if you would say you are liberal or on the left. Raise your hand high right now. Okay. Please raise your hand high if you'd say you're conservative or on the right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay. That's actually pretty good. That's much more so than most places in the academic world. Um, now, I saw some of those hands I had, I could see, but you couldn't because they were like this. Um, there is. Um, um, there is a lot of, um, well, there's a hostile climate in the, in the academic world for conservatives. Um, and if you value diversity because it helps us think, this is the most important kind of diversity that there is. Anyway, um, so Wilson's prophecy, I believe, has come true. Wilson was absolutely right. Uh, the, the analytic philosophers had botched morality, I believe. Uh, they were basically arguing about how many angels can sit on the head of a pin when there aren't any angels. Um, and now that it's been made an empirical study, I think we're making really rapid progress in one in which philosophers and psychologists are working together. Uh, so I think where we are is that in the 70s, there, uh, 70s through the 90s, there was a kind of a consensus that the, the key to studying morality is studying reasoning, uh, that you can ground morality in one, on one pillar, uh, and philosophy and psychology were the main disciplines working together. Uh, but now the new synthesis is here. And now the dominant process is widely seen to be something like intuition. Um, many people are moving towards a more pluralist perspective, which is much more welcoming for cultural diversity and political diversity. Uh, philosophy is still involved, but the action has really come from the linkage between psychology and neuroscience. That's what really energized things beginning in the 90s uh, with Damasio and Josh, and Josh Green and, and many others nowadays. Uh, but it really is a new synthesis, as Wilson said. That is, all the branches are coming together, and, and we read each other's work. And you go to a conference on morality nowadays, everybody knows a little bit about psychopaths and bonobos and babies looking at you know, uh, cars going up hills. And we have a kind of a common knowledge base across many, many disciplines. And it's really, it's a very exciting time. Um, so I'll stop there. I'll just leave these. If you want, uh, I hope we can talk about normative implications. So let's, we'll start with just qu general questions that you might have about the book. Um, and then if anybody wants to ask about or talk about normative Im implications, I think these are, are some of them. Um, so let us talk. Thank you. This is a cognitive model of what people are doing when they're doing morality. Um, so what are normative ethicists doing? Are they, you know, is Temkin sitting in his office just doing nonsense right now? Um, mm -hmm. I guess, and do you, I guess, do you think that these ethicists, these normative ethicists actually believe uh, their own normative theories? I, I mean, there's evidence from Schwitzkebel that they really don't. Wait, wait. Swiss Cable has evidence that they don't believe, don't believe their normative theories or don't well, act on Well, that they don't them. act on right. them. Right. And I mean, I guess that's what I'm saying. Uh, do they actually you know, hold these normative theories for themselves? Right. 
great, great questions. So I spent, uh, spent a year at Princeton at the Center for Human Values. Um, I think that was the last time I, was, I spoke here at, at Rutgers in 2007. And I, I, I was hoping, I, mean, I, have, I have such a strong sense that there are major applications and implications of empirical research for normative ethics. And I spent the year talking with philosophers trying to explore those and did not make very much progress. And what, part of the reason, I think, is because the, the, the project of the social scientist or the sciences is to figure out what, what is, how do things work, truth is out there. And my sense was that the project for the moral philosophers was a project of justification. It, the project is, how ca can I offer a good argument to support some proposition or some conclusion? And it becomes kind of like a game. And there are communities. And so there are communities that organize around one proposition that ultimately harm is what matters. There are others that organize around another proposition that we have these rights you see. And um, So if you look at the community of philosophers as an anthropologist would or a sociologist of science, you see them as communities that are developing questions of interest, topics of interest, and there are challenges. You know, like who can solve for a Metplast theorem? Who can justify utilitarianism? Who can um, uh, justify equality of the sexes? There are all sorts of things for which one could give an argument. And arguments have to have some sort of premise. Um, so you, if people kind of agree on the premises, and those can either go unstated or they're just widely accepted, then they can do it. But it reduces to a kind of a game. And it would be one thing if there was clear progress. If philosophers had the sense that, well, 100 years ago, man, were we ignorant. But now we're really close. We're really closing in. Well, you know, then I'd be willing to give them more time. Say, all right, let's give them another 50 years. But I don't know, Steve, is there, I mean, well, until, you know, until, you took the, until philosophy took the empirical turn, would you say as of 1990, would you say there was a general sense among ethicists that there's been progress over the last 2,000 years? Yes. OK. How, you mean 2,000 years. So how about in the 20th century? Was there a sense in 1990 there was progress? Absolutely. OK. okay. So, okay. I, I am wrong. So tell me, here. how, how was there progress? So tell me the progress. I didn't say a justified sense. John, you asked whether they thought they were making progress. And the answer is, yep, they did. Oh, you <laughs> OK. Uh, it's been said about psychology that we make progress by overcoming the obstacles that we've placed in our own path. So maybe, perhaps it was in that sense. Uh, at any rate, um, so yeah, philosophers are playing a, a, a different game. And uh, it also should be said that they are different from other people. They are higher on rationality. They're better reasoners. And they're lower on emotionality. Um, so they're often not very good models for the rest of us. And then given the Schwitz-Gable finding that they're not different from us, I think that's pretty damning uh, as to whether knowing the good will make you do the good. OK, other questions? Yeah, just come, up, come on up. Come on, you all, you all must have some questions. Come on up. Hello. I really, I kind of enjoyed your presentation. Kind of. I found uh, <laughs> just a little bit. It was, okay. but um, I found it really interesting how you pointed out that Atheists have made reason sacred, and this has caused them to become illogical. The new atheists, not all, not most, just the right. new atheists. And um, and I find this really interesting because uh, I'm currently pursuing, I guess, a career in science. I'm majoring in physics, minoring in biochem, and I decided to pick up a minor in philosophy because I realized by looking at these people and realizing how foolish they are that it's not enough to know how to think. You have to know how to think about thinking, and I think it really comes down to. We've been hearing our entire lives that God works in mysterious ways, and none, nobody's willing to think, well, evolution is mysterious. The Big Bang Theory is mysterious. Why is it that religion and science have to oppose each other? And I guess I think they don't. You know, uh, There really isn't any sound argument for atheism the same way there isn't a sound argument for religion, because they're both based on faith. They're based on belief, because you don't have any experiments to prove this. And so if there are all these rational scientific men, I guess what I'm asking is, how do you think they went about becoming their own enemies? OK. Well, so the new atheists, let's separate them off to the side, because they are angry, uh, and they are organizing. And Dawkins makes it clear in his book that this is that he's an activist. He wants to raise consciousness. So let's separate them off. Let's just look at scientists. The great majority of scientists, uh, well, almost all scientists are naturalists. Now, you can be a naturalist and believe in God, and some do. Um, the great majority of scientists are naturalists, and I think the majority, certainly in the fields you talked about, don't believe in, in God. Uh, is that the same? Uh, is, that, is that epistemologically the same as believing in God? I don't think so. If, if you want to say that the only, um, the only standard of proof is an experiment to prove something one way or another, 
well, then, sure, I, I couldn't, you know, there's no experimental proof either way. Um, but there are, uh, there are both degrees of plausibility and there are also, uh, there are trends in findings. So um, the idea, the theistic conception that God in, is involved in our everyday lives and makes things happen, it's very widely believed around the world, um, um, that, that either is or isn't true. And at a certain point, since there's never been any evidence of a miracle, despite many claims of them, um, at a certain point, you have to conclude, you know what? Maybe things don't happen because God is intervening. Uh, it now seems rather unlikely. And of course, one can't prove that God never, ever intervenes, just that God doesn't, you know, if both sides pray to win in a football game and one wins, you can't say, well, see, they were right. Um, so I really don't think that, I really don't think that the community of science, so science, what's miraculous about science is not that scientists are so smart. There are smart people in, in, in every profession. What's miraculous about science is that it's an institution that you put people together to challenge each other's reasons and truth emerges. I don't think that's true in the theological community. Now, of course, the Catholics have a long tradition. There is argumentation. There is a process of filters. So I, shouldn't, I shouldn't speak too soon on that. Um, but I, I, I don't think that they are epistemologically the same. And I don't think, and the kind of faith that we have in science you know, it's what, faith that, um, that Galileo really lived? I mean, yeah, I have faith that he lived. There's no, but I mean, how, I don't see how we have, how science depends on faith rather than a trivial sense. Do you want to come back on that or is that? Just shout it out if you have a quick rejoinder. I mean, I guess it is, it's sort of like we, you open up a textbook and you read it and it's like these formulas and this guy sat in the lab and he did these experiments. And you're taking it on faith that it's not all just a big hoax and they're all, Okay, well, yes, you're, you, okay, you are taking it on faith, but it's a faith which is open to testing, and often things do get tested and revised. Now, when religious folk take it on faith that Muhammad got a revelation, that is not verifiable. I mean, if the historical scholarship suggests that none of these prophets even existed, um, even Jesus. Nobody saw him, nobody wrote about him, there's no evidence that Jesus existed. No mention of him until decades after his death. And this was in Roman times, there's a lot of documentation from the time. So, um, you know, I, I think, the replicability of scientists' theory, uh, you know, I think it's fundamentally different. Yes. Okay. Or uh, shout it out, or go to the microphone. And please, if you're if you don't raise your hand, just go to the microphones now. Oh, you can. Yeah, you can, uh, this one I'll turn on. Try that. Yeah, uh, there you go. Thanks very much. So first of all, I would love to hear more about all this this stuff here. Uh, but the second thing is, I, I was really curious to hear more about this this evidence you mentioned that critical thinking doesn't work. How, how, how do you know that it's not just that it's being taught badly or something like that and, and that it just it just is impossible? Because it seems that you're, you're depending on that. Okay. Uh, so there was a review article by Lilienfeld. I believe it's in the footnotes. If you look in the book, uh, in the reference section under Lilienfeld, Scott Lilienfeld's a really great psychologist, um, really challenges a lot of sacred cows. And there was a lot of, uh, you know, so you look old enough to remember as I do that in the 80s, Oh, critical thinking. All the schools were supposed to teach critical thinking. We don't hear about that anymore because the programs didn't work. Um, what I, as I understand it, you, you can show progress on certain aspects of thinking. People can get better at finding evidence and organizing evidence for their side. Um, when you, if, you, if you tell people now, look on both sides, they just can't do it. It's like, you know, we're going to teach people to use a knife and fork, and then we want them to use that to saw down a tree. It just doesn't work. So. Uh, it could still happen. Someone might still find it. Now, I think if somebody would say, you know, I think we could possibly do critical thinking by saying, okay, human reasoning is designed for this purpose. It doesn't work for other purposes. If you want to do critical thinking, here's what you do. Find somebody who disagrees with you. Sit down, get to know each other, have a few meals together, trust each other. Over time, that person will be able to critique you. And now, a year from now, let's talk and, and see if you consult that person for help. I think you could do it but it would be a social intuitionist kind of critical thinking, not rationalist critical thinking. <coughs> yes? Oh, which was that? He asked about the normative implications. What are the normative implications of? OK, while well, standing on one foot in the remaining six, uh, seven minutes, um, I'll simply say that um, for individuals to adopt a rationalist ethos, they're just so vulnerable to fudging uh, that it's just hopeless. Um, uh, I think virtue ethics, of the major theories, I think virtue ethics is the only one which is really appropriate for real human beings. Cultivate virtue by habit over the course of years. Cultivate it in your children. Uh, worry about who they associate with. So if you want to encourage good behavior in your children or in yourself, 
I would say, uh, uh, think about virtue ethics, not, not the other kind. For public policy, however, it's different. For public policy, um, we have diversity. If we were a small nation with uh, sh shared norms, we, could, we, had some, we would have some other options. But we're not. We have a lot of diversity. And it's one of the geniuses of the founders of our country is to say, we don't have to all agree. Democracy is not about agreement. Democracy is about how we make laws, given that we don't agree. Um, so for uh, democracy with diversity in it, I think there's no alternative to basically uh, consequentialist legislation. Bentham was right, and I'm very grateful to him for putting English law on the base of consequentialism. The problem is that the people who do that, the people who are attracted to that way of thinking, tend to be on the spectrum towards Asperger's. They don't understand human nature, and they engineer these worlds that couldn't possibly work. So if you're a real utilitarian, you would want people who understand all this sacredness stuff, all these moral foundations. Basically, you'd want Emil Durkheim to do your legislating for you. Or at least Durkheim and a bunch of other people who, who get it. That's why I call it Durkheimian utilitarianism. Um, I think that's the best approach to, uh, um, to public policy. OK, yes. Um, so you use the term reason generally to refer to conscious deliberative Absolutely. processing. Yes. But yes, that's crucial. Often in cognitive science, reasoning means uh, kind of computational processing that can be conscious or unconscious. Um, so so yeah, do you think that intuition. there's a role for unconscious reasoning? Yes, I call it intuition. Yeah, that's right. it's all cognition. That's right. If it is, my argument and Hume's argument depend crucially on saying reasoning is conscious and verbal. That's the way Kohlberg used it. That's why it gets interesting. Now, once you say it's just computation or cognition, well, of course it is. I've been saying that all along. It's all cognition. I'm not saying it's emotion versus cognition. Please, never, ever contrast cognition versus emotion. It's totally hopeless. OK, so yeah, unconscious so can cognition. You, sure. Can you talk a little bit more about what kinds of cognition you think are involved? And if, it, huh? if you think that kind of uh, cognition is different from the kinds of appraisal processes that John McHyle talks about, or how you think your That's theory also, integrates yeah. with his. Yeah, um, the mind is a neural network. Uh, it does all kinds of stuff. It's somewhat modularized. Um, these modules are the outputs of them, I would say, well, the definition I give of intuition is that something emerges into consciousness. So most of what the mind is doing, you can't even call it an intuition on my definition because nothing emerges into consciousness. At least it's not a moral intuition, but it's unconscious processing. It's automatic processing. Um, John McHale's, the sort of the low level appraisals, you know, causality, um, priority, I mean, all those things. Yeah, the mind does that right away. Animal minds do that too. So to the extent that brains do cognition, they do computation, they always have. That's what I, you know, that's the elephant. It's all this rapid automatic stuff. And you, you're doing a thousand things at a time. Um, it's, but that's not what Plato meant. That's not what Kohlberg meant by reasoning. Um, in another one of your talks, you mentioned that we should be more open to using the like whole five moral pillars. Mm -hmm. I, I wanted to know what you thought would be the appropriate, like how do we find out what to be loyal to and what authority to respect if most people just do it based on what they were raised in. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of deliberation. Going yeah, on. No, that's right. This, that, this is a really good question. It's one that, that many people ask because uh, I am, so if I say that there are all these different taste buds, there's no obligation to use them. Like we have a bitter taste bud. Does that mean that food should have bitterness in it? Not necessarily. Um, before there were governments, before there was democracy, uh, before there was large scale civilization with laws, we had to do everything based on our own sort of internal code of ethics. And you still find that in the world, in small scale societies and in gangs. Gangs are based very much on this, these five founders. These a lot of purity, a lot of loyalty. Um, so I'm not at all saying, because we used to do it with all of them, we need to do it with all of them. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, what I'm saying is that as an empirical matter, what I've come to see is that if you reduce everything to just concerns about harm, it's very difficult to solve this problem. How do you get groups together? Um, for example, I think the, you know, probably one of the worst things in our society is men who father children and don't raise them. I think it's a terrible, terrible thing. Um, the left won't talk about it, uh, but the right's been talking about it for a long time. The idea of the family as a unit, um, which is organized for the care of children, which people have duties and obligations to it, it's an empirical question whether that's good. And the empirical evidence seems really strong. Conservatives are happier than liberals. They give more to charity. That's mostly because they're more religious. For religious groups, basically, it's the Durkheimian approach. If you constrain people, tie them in so that they do their duty to their local community, it ends up better for everyone. That's the conclusion of Putnam and Campbell. So had it turned out 
that religious groups, religious people were worse. They gave less to others. They just focused on themselves. They didn't care about others. They imposed costs on others. Then I would be changing my tune. Then I would be saying, basically, I don't know if you've read Josh Green's book, He's, uh, the manuscript of it. Have you read his new book? Um, uh, I forget what his term is for it. But um, basically, you know, I'm a sort of a utilitarian. So if it turned out that, that encouraging loyalty to your group or your family was a bad thing, I'd say, don't do it. But it turns out to be a good thing. Um, so, so yeah, I, we, we need to tone, like obviously purity is the hardest one because that tends to, it, it was used for the, the Jim Crow laws, it was used to ex exclude gays. So purity needs to come way down from traditional times, and it has, and that's a good thing. But if you're, uh, I, I think it's not necessarily good to bring it all the way to zero. It's, it's good to, for example, to, to treat your country as, as not just a collection of individuals who pay taxes, to have some feelings of patriotism. I think these are good things. Hello. <clears throat> um, so in your model appears that uh, reason is really kind of subjugated to intuitions, kind of in this pretty weak role of more or less justifying the intuitions that are already have. Yes, in the moral domain. Yes. In the moral domain, right. So I'm wondering, I actually really like your addition of kind of the social piece, adding in that context that indeed uh, moral judgments don't exist in a vacuum and really are influenced by social factors. I mean, my likelihood of expressing an unpopular opinion in a group of people that I don't know, they're liable to you know, enact negative consequences a lot less than right. in a room of my peers or something like that. But I'm wondering, what do you think the social dimension actually adds to moral judgment? It sounds like you think that uh, being part of groups somehow actually can influence mm -hmm. the moral intuition process above and beyond individual reasoning, that somehow adding other people into the equation allows reasons to get in to these intuitions. Yeah, I, no, I think that's right. So if you think of moral judgment as a kind of psychophysics, you know, you take a person, you show them, you know, a flashing light and how, how, how close together can they still resolve it. Um, psychophysics is something you don't need other people for. Now then you could do studies showing that when you're near other people, you overestimate, you know, so maybe other people will influence, but fundamentally, visual perception is a solitary act. Um, is moral judgment like that? And for rationalists, I think the answer is yes. You can judge whether someone's rights are being violated, et cetera. It's a, almost a perceptual process. Or it's more complex, but it's like a perceptual process. Um, but I see moral truths as being emergent. I see moral truths as being like the truths of the market. So suppose there was a planet where there was no intelligent life, um, and there was you know, some mineral there. How much is it worth? It's a nonsensical question. Um, on this planet, there's gold and there's silver. Which is worth more? Which one is worth more by ounce? Gold. And is that objectively true? Is that a non-anthropogenic truth, a fact about the universe? Earth is the third planet from the sun. Gold is worth more than silver. Is, that, is it like that? Of course not. Right. So I think moral truths emerge like the truths of a marketplace. Gold is not more valuable just because I believe it's more valuable. It's not, I'm, I'm not a relativist in that sense. But there are emergent truths. Women should have equal political rights compared to men. Raise your hand if you think that is true. That's a fact. It's not just, your, it's true. Women should have equal rights. Raise your hand. I think so too. Now, but I'm not willing to say that for the last five million years, our ancestors were all wrong until 1968. Reality's changed. And the truths of family life are such that we don't need to have such a division of labor as we used to. That's, my, that's the way I think about truth, moral truth. So now does that lead you to moral relativism? No, it leads me to emergentism. Now if you're hardcore, Realist, then yes, I'm a relativist. I'll accept that. But, it's, but usually hardcore realists want to say that relativists say, if it feels good, do it. It's up to you. Everybody has their own ethics. No, we don't have our own ethics anywhere. We have our own language. I can't make up my own language, and I can't make up my own, my own ethics. Um, so there's a kind of reality to normative facts. But it's the kind, it's just like gold is worth more than silver. That is a true statement. OK, thank you. Thank you. Hello. So uh, I'm going to tackle the for science, it's the need for ideological diversity. Mm -hmm. You say that um, it needs to be more than race and gender, which seems to me to be kind of like um, establishing more than just someone's background, but really about the ideas that they can bring to the table. That's right. And that's why, that's why diversity is valuable. That's so, correct. So my question is, what would be a model where you would maximize how much ideological diversity you would have? Because you, you just demonstrated it through uh, a polit uh, political lens, where whether people identified as left and liberal or right and conservative, which I think is, in, in my experience, I learned my political like ideolog ideologies 
from my father who learned from his father. So they're not really completely unique to me, and I might not offer anything from that perspective that no one else in the room could. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking to find ideas that are of value and that could really kind of motivate us to, to reach some kind of new understanding, what system best promotes that? Um, well, the research on the value of diversity is amazingly thin. Uh, everyone in the academy is so gung-ho about diversity, but the demonstrations that diversity actually makes groups think better, work better, be more creative is very thin. And the extent that it, it does uh, sometimes do that is because you bring people who come from different backgrounds. Like one guy is from accounting, another, another woman is from sales, and you get them together in the company, and the different diversity perspectives, they bring something else. Uh, that makes them more productive. Um, the idea that simply because you have racial diversity in a room that's going to make people think better is not really true. Um, now, as for when is it useful, if the goal of a group is cohesion, then you don't want diversity. So if you're the US military, you do not want diversity. Now, the military has been great at making racial diversity not matter. You want everybody to think the same. Have, well, I shouldn't say that. You want people to have a sense that they're all one, and it's not particularly valuable to have diversity in the military. And they've been great at making racial diversity not, and gender not matter. Um, but if the goal is finding truth, if you're an academic group, suppose you're the Defense Intelligence Agency. Do you want all hardcore hawkish Republicans in the Defense Intelligence Agency if their goal is to find truth? Perhaps that'd be terrible. And that's what I think George Bush kind of did. Um, and the same with, the, so if the goal of groups is to find truth, then you don't want too much cohesion. You actually want people to challenge. Um, there's a, 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 George Will has a line, uh, in the academy they want diversity in everything except thought. And he's right. We actively discriminate against admitting people who think differently, and we incredibly, we discriminate really heavily in favor of racial diversity. So what would be a way to maximize that? How would you go about finding these people to create a collective that'd be worthy of that? Oh, you mean in the sciences? Yeah, in, so, well, in anything, yeah. rather. Well, well, so I'm writing a paper on that right now. And what we did was we just looked at the APA, the American Psychological Association. They have a list of, of they have a, lots of documents on diversity. We just looked at their recommendations. Here's how you create diversity. First, you know, you have groups that study where people are being excluded. We just changed uh, race to uh, ideology. A lot of them work great. So what, what would be some example ideologies that you would be using to mark these people? Because oh, before, oh, before, before it was described as political, which yeah. I'm, that's the main I'm one under that the impression no, is not that's enough. The main, that's the most important one, because the, acad the academic world nowadays is not, it does want to find truth, but its sacred value, I believe, is fighting racism. That's the most sacred value in many departments, especially in the humanities and, and sociology and anthro. So if, if the group is binding and blinding around fighting racism, the most important thing is to break that up, to have some non-liberals there who will say, wait, but look at the evidence here. All right. Take it. OK. OK. And actually, I have to go. So OK. okay. Very last question. Quick answer while I'm packing up, and then I got to run. Um, when it comes to the moral foundations and how, like, while reading the book, which I loved, uh, the interrelatedness of the foundations, would you say that's a fair statement? Because, so uh, like, how interrelated the different mm -hmm. foundations are? Yeah because you're talking about how conservatives tend to have a more balanced approach. So would you say, say, for example, pro-lifers, mm -hmm. they have a care for the unborn purely because of the sanctity of life in view with their religious beliefs? Or how would you go about, would you say that they're individually motivated for each foundation or that there is a connection amongst them all? Right. So you can't take uh, people's justifications at face value. Um, we did a study at Your Morals. It's on our website. It's at uh, moralfoundations.org. We did a study where we looked at people's cultural attitudes and we have other moral foundation scores. It turns out that your scores on care don't predict your views on abortion. What predicts is sanctity. Abortion, it's not that conservatives care for children more than liberals. That's not true. It's that conservatives see the world as not just material. So liberals say, well, if it's not conscious, then it's not a life. There's no, nothing wrong with an abortion at five months. Um, so, so the difference is, uh, is not based on care, it's based on sanctity. Um, secondly, the, the foundations do sometimes, the relationship is generally that uh, uh, loyalty and authority, are, those tend to go together very tightly. Um, sanctity is off to the side, and then care and equality go together, but care and proportionality don't. So there are lots of interrelations among the foundations. Um, it's not that conservatives have a more balanced view necessarily, it's just that they uh, perceive moral radiation uh, or moral flavors that liberals sometimes don't. And there are times when I think those are useful from a Durkheimian utilitarian point of view, such as respect for teacher's authority. Um, there's a book, Judging School Discipline. When liberals pushed to allow students to sue teachers and schools in the 60s, they thought they were fighting for the victims. But in fact, they, it sowed chaos in poor school districts.
So authority has some uses, that sort of thing. Okay, thanks everyone. Good luck with the rest of the class.